Welcome back to the True Crime Corner with Mama Venus. I am back to delivering your weekly dose of South African true crime. If you are new here, welcome. I hope you are here to stay. If you are watching this or listening to it on YouTube, please go ahead and click on the subscribe button if you haven't. Also click on the notification bell so you won't miss any of my videos. If you are listening to this on the other podcasting platforms, please go ahead and follow me and listen to my other episode. I will be uploading more episodes over the coming weeks and I'm looking to do more podcast exclusive cases. Those past few weeks have been nothing but absolute chaos in the South African true crime streets. Like the last time I was here, I spoke about the case of Batobile Mlangeni, the SPV security guard who strolled off with 4 million rand and went on a run for about two and a half years. She was finally found and arrested and sentenced to eight years in prison. And then the week before that, I spoke about the four serial killers Abolas was Mazingane, um, wanting to be paroled. Like, I think they killed about, collectively, about 100 people and were sentenced something ridiculous about a thousand years each or something. You know, I'm going to link um, all the cases in the description box below. But, I mean, all those cases are taking place in real time. And as much as true crime is not about what's trending at that moment, it's difficult for me at least to not talk about what's currently trending and relevant at the time. So that's why against my better judgment, uh, I'm going to do a two or three part series on the Tabo Best Outfit All. Like this is one of many stories that has showed us how much of a joke the South African justice system can be like, I cannot believe it. Anyways, the first part is going to be focusing solely on his crimes leading up to his convictions in 2012. Then the second part and possibly third part will focus on his fake death and all the current um, chaos. So without further ado, let's begin with part one of the story. I usually like to begin this type of stories with maybe a background of the person, like their real name, when and where they were born, who were their parents, did they have siblings, their childhood, how was their family life growing up, basically the human they were before they became a depraved criminal. But in this case, it is nearly impossible to source that kind of information, for me at least, because... There's just so much confusion around this case. Um, Tabo Besta had so many aliases that we don't even know if Tabo Besta is his real name. Some of those aliases included Abo Thomas Besta, Tom Besta, Tabo Tom Besta, Tom Kelly, Thomas Kelly Besta, Thomas Berter. Like, you ha, guys, it's a lot, really. So to prevent any further confusion, I will leave out any and everything that has to do with Tabo Pesta's background because I would not like to speculate and possibly lie to you guys. So let's begin with the story. The story of Tabo Pesta comes to light, meaning it begins to be documented in the media back in 2011. This time, he had been pasted on newspapers as one of the most wanted criminals in the country for crimes against women. This included fraud, rape, murder, and robbery. Around this time, Tabo had been using Facebook to lure young women who aspired to be models around the country. He had a Facebook page where he posed as a casting agent, promising to find modeling jobs for the young women. He would then request that they meet in Durban, to discuss a way forward. And like some of those women traveled from far guys, like one woman drove from Johannesburg to Durban. This is where he would then take them to an isolated area, sometimes book them into a hotel or b and threaten them with a knife and then proceed to sexually assault and rob them of their belongings. This, those crimes, earned him the name Facebook Rapist. 
making him the first known Facebook rapist in South Africa. Side note, this story low-key reminds me of the Tolisa Sojata story, the Kumbu Facebook rapist. It was the first case I covered here on my channel. I shall be doing an update on the case in the near future because there's been um, recent uh, developments on the case. Anyways, back to Tabo Pesta. In this Facebook rapist crimes, right, it is not clear why he was able to evade arrest for such a long time because his picture was already out there. And apparently he had been questioned by the police sometime in May 2011. However, nothing had come out of that and it was treated as a case of mistaken identity. According to a report by Sunday Times, he had been questioned while in the process of scamming another group of women. But the questioning was, of course, about one of his Facebook rapist crimes. The police were not aware of the scamming he was about to do. Apparently, this is how the story goes, Besta had rounded up a group of 10 prospective models and he promised them 2,000 rand each for a two and a half day work as hostesses in an ANC event at a five-star hotel in Johannesburg. He had hired a luxury transport bus and transported all the women from Cape Town to Johannesburg. They stayed at a Rivonia guest house and this is where the police arrived to question Besta. After questioning him, they came to apologize to him and the women and they said that it was a case of mistaken identity. I am not sure what he had said to convince the police at this time, but it is at this point in my research where I started to have questions on how the investigation to his cases was handled. For example, what does mistaken identity mean in this case? Does it mean that you don't actually look like the suspects uh, on the identikits that were provided by the victims, of which we all know that he does? Or you do look like the suspect on the identity kit, but maybe your name on your ID or your height or any other distinguishing factor, or maybe your alibi does not put you um, at the crime scene. I'd be interested to know that, but also with his history of paying off law enforcement, you just never know, man. You never know. Anyways, let's continue. So right after the police left, after they had apologized to both Tabo and the women, Besta requested that the women hand over their cell phones and laptops to him because he wanted to perform some sort of security screening. The women handed over their stuff and literally that's the last time they saw or heard from Tabo. It took them a bit of a while though to realize that they were being robbed. They ended up having to call the hotel that they were supposed to be working at and the hotel told them that they had no bookings of that kind, they had no events of that kind um, that weekend and they had no knowledge of a person named Tabo or Tom Besta. Whilst Tabo Besta was busy with his shenanigans, his Facebook rapist crimes, scamming women all over the country, he started dating a 26-year-old woman by the name of Nomfundo Julu. There's not much information out there about who Nomfundo was, but we know that she worked as a car salesperson for a BMW dealership in Johannesburg. There are conflicting statements about how the two met, how Tabo met Nomfundo, one source says that they met when Nomfundo sold Besta a BMW in 2011. Another source says that they met outside a hair salon in Joburg. And another one suggests that they had met on Facebook whilst Tabo was posing as a casting agent. For me, it really doesn't matter how the two met. The whole thing was just really unfortunate for Nomfundo. And my heart goes out to her family and friends. Right after Tabo and Nomfundo met, they are said to have gotten into a romantic relationship and Nomfundo would frequently travel around the country, Durban, Cape Town, for vacations with Tabo. It was on the Cape Town trip, though, that Nomfundo would end up losing her life. She was found stabbed to death in the Ocean Breeze Villa Retreat in Cape Town on the 23rd of September 2011. When Numfundo was discovered, she was without some of her belongings. This includes money, cell phones, and laptops. In a press briefing given by the police after Numfundo's discovery, the police warned the public that a man fitting Besta's description was the primary suspect to the murder. He was described as charming, good-looking, and in his early 20s. 
This is when they also released the names of his 13 aliases and started telling the public about his crimes as a Facebook rapist. The case quickly gained traction in the media and he was now linked to at least 30 cases of crime against women and this included murder, sexual assault, kidnapping, theft and fraud. I mean, Guy was a serious con man and we will see this as the story goes on. As the search was intensifying, Bester basically decided to start taunting the police. He would occasionally post on his Facebook page saying things like he likes being surrounded by hot girls and he went as far as making a phone call to the police. This phone call was made using one of his aliases, Thomas Bester, and it was directed at Lieutenant Colonel Anton Boysen, who was at the time the head of Psychologically Motivated Crimes Unit in KZN. This call lasted an entire 17 minutes, imagine. Like, okay, side notes. I know that we are a developing country, ne? and taking into account that this took place in like around 2011, I am interested to know though, if at the time, or even now, had we not invested in technology that can at least track calls, or maybe Dim who is watching too many spy movies, because I mean, 17 minutes is a long time to spend with a wanted criminal on the phone without doing all you can to find out where he can possibly be. But okay, what do I know? While on this call, Thomas Bester told Colonel Boysen that he was a convicted criminal. In fact, at the time of committing his crimes, he was out on parole after serving a two-year sentence behind bars for fraud. He is said to have been very cold and calm during the conversation and he spoke about wanting to end his life, saying things like, I want to get out, I want out. Um, and for me, not to invalidate anyone's um, suicidal thoughts or feelings, but I genuinely don't think that he wanted to kill himself. I think he just wanted to find out how the police will react or the public would react and possibly get more attention, really, you know, but I don't know. A few weeks after the stunt, after calling the police, Bester was arrested in Johannesburg and he was transported to Durban to stand his first trial. This was for the crimes he had committed as a Facebook rapist, as most of them were committed in Durban. Even though he had sexually assaulted and robbed many women, he was only tried for crimes that he committed against two women, of which one of them he later confessed to have murdered. According to his statement that was read out in court, his first victim drove from Johannesburg to Durban in her own car. She booked herself into a hotel in Umslanga where Tabo met her and proceeded to sexually assault and rob her of her belongings. The second victim, he says he met her just a few days later and he sexually assaulted and murdered her in a house in Westville, Durban. He was found guilty of these crimes and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. After this trial, he was then transported to Cape Town so he could stand trial for Nomfundo Gyulu's murder. Here, he pleaded guilty to Nomfundo's murder and in a detailed statement read out by his lawyer in court, he detailed how he and the young woman had met. He told the court that they had met in January 2011 whilst Nomfundo worked at BMW in Sentin. They met while Nomfundo was selling him a BMW 1 Series. Of which, side note, I think he was able to afford with all his fraud and robbery money, but that's neither here nor there. He said there was an instant mutual attraction between them, and by March the same year, 2011, they had formed an intimate relationship, despite them living in different provinces. Numfundo resided in Gauteng and Besta in KZN at the time. So, they were in a long-distance relationship. They planned a vacation in September, as Numfundo had indicated that she will be going on leave until the end of September. Tabo Besta says that he booked both of them flights to Cape Town and they decided to stay at the Ocean Breeze B&B in Sunset Beach. Now, on the incident, there are so many things that aren't entirely clear, for me at least. It's not entirely clear about the timeline, whether this took place in the evening of the 21st or the 22nd of September. Also, what was the argument about? So Tabo says in the evening of their arrival, right? They had an argument about one of his ex-girlfriends who was under the impression that he wanted a permanent relationship with her. It's not clear here if 
it's the ex-girlfriend who was under the impression like maybe she was bothering Tabo because she had been under the impression that he wanted a permanent relationship with her. Or it was Nomfundo who was arguing with Tabo because she was under the impression that he wanted a permanent relationship with the ex-girlfriend. I just wanted to clarify that. Also, another thing I'm not sure about is if the argument had continued until 2 a.m. or they had woken up at 2 a.m. and started arguing again because it is at this time at 2 a.m. that Tabo Besta says that he woke up and went to grab a knife in the kitchen. Nomfundo was awake at this time and she saw him approaching with the knife. They became involved in a struggle for the position of the knife and in that struggle, Nomfundo was stabbed in her chest and possibly got her lung punctured in the process. Straight after Pesta stabbed Nomfundo, he noticed that she was bleeding profusely and she was lying face down on the bed at this point. To prove that he intended to kill her and that this wasn't in a fit of rage or necessarily a crime of passion, Pesta tied Nomfundo's hands behind her back and continued to demand that she gives him her laptop password. Imagine. This woman is bleeding to death and when are you are trying to get a laptop password. Of course he intended to kill her. She obviously couldn't respond at this point. She had probably lost um, consciousness and she unfortunately lost her life. Tabo Besta is said to have stayed with Nomfundo's deceased body until 7 a.m. He then took her laptop and cell phone and some of her money and then went to the guest house owner and asked for a lift to the city center. And then he later flew back to Durban. The guest house owner, I think, might have asked Tabo about his companion because in his statement, he does admit that he had told the owner that Nomfundo was still sleeping and should not be disturbed or woken up until 2 p.m., of which by then he had probably left Cape Town. In his statement, he also apologized for murdering Nomfundo, saying, I quote, I am deeply sorry for killing Nomfundo. I realized that my actions were wrong and unlawful, and I will be punished for the unlawful killing of another human being. But nonetheless, I have pleaded guilty. Close quote. For me, <laughs> this apology was more of a formality, and if he had wanted to sound remorseful, he could have done better because this really was not giving. At the end of the trial, Tabo Pesta was sentenced to life in prison and an additional 25 years for robbery with aggravating circumstances. Under normal circumstances, this is where the story would end. Mr. Besta would go to jail and leave the rest of his days behind bars. But as we all know, this was just the beginning. The beginning of one of the most bizarre cases in South Africa since the likes of Abu Ananya Smate, Andre Standa, and Colin Chau game. Okay, guys, this is where we are going to end it with part one of the Tabo Besta of it all. I am currently putting together a script for part two, where we will talk about his time in prison and his escape. I will be posting it over the next couple of days. I promise not to make you wait for too long. Yeah, fam, hope you enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you haven't. Thank you, fam. See you on the next one. Goodbye.